we're going to be talking about come awake in me. And what we're going to be talking about with that is the Holy Spirit and love and actually acting like and living out what God has for us. I want to cover a couple things that uh, that's going on. Um, the lighting, obviously, is is been an issue, and we're going to be working on that this week. Um, hopefully, we'll get it squared away this week. But uh, everything kind of runs through a digital system. We can operate operate it on a computer back in the back, um, but sometimes connections aren't great, and so things get a little a little weird. So. That's what was happening last week with that, um, but that should be straightened out, hopefully next week for you. Um, last Sunday, our good friend Morris Hirschberger passed away, and so he is no longer on this earth with us, but he is rejoicing with our Father in Heaven, with Jesus, and with uh, relatives and friends that have gone before him. I got to tell you, it does make me a little bit jealous um, just because even though I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, I know it's going to be stinking awesome. So um, so he's going, uh, I'm sure that he's just absolutely having a blast right now. But um, let's do continue to remember Blanche and the family, um, because even though he's having a good time, uh, people here are definitely going to miss him. Love that dude. Um, Brittany and my family, they're, they're not feeling super great this whole past weekend. I feel fine, so I, I praise God for that. My mom is, is in from Canada. We razzed her a little bit last week for bringing the cold weather with her. With her. She does that every year. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but it is true. And she says that it's the Alberta effect. I'm like, yes, but you're the one from Alberta coming here. Um, not, and honestly, I would, I'll take the cold weather in, in order to be able to have her, but, um, but yeah, it does make it a little, little chilly around here from time to time. So, the, the time this morning, God has just really been working on intimacy with me, and and man, I mean, even this morning I came in a little early and just just to spend some time with the Lord in worship and in prayer, and um, it was a really good time. I wish you guys could have been here. You would have loved it. But uh, um, some of the stuff that he's just really been putting in my heart is he's wanting to awaken us. He's wanting to to have this deeper, more intimate, personal relationship with Him. He's, want, he's drawing us and calling us to come into this relationship with Him that's deeper than we've experienced so far. Even if you've had just this outstanding, intimate relationship with Him, it can go so much deeper. It can go so much deeper. The less that we see ourselves, the less that we focus on ourselves and our own needs and wants and desires, these things, the more that we push them aside and just focus on Him and seek Him, He will begin to come awake even more in us. And, and I'm not saying that He's not awake already. I'm saying that that Spirit that is in us, that is His Spirit, will awaken more. We want more. Of him, we, we sing, God, we want more of you. We want more of you. And he's like, I'm right here. I want more of you. It's not that, that he's holding back from us. It's that we're holding back from him. I'm telling you, it's the truth because I'm experiencing it. You're experiencing it. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you will awaken our souls to you, Lord, that you will awaken our spirits to you 
even more, God. That your Holy Spirit will lead us, God. Your Holy Spirit will will open up more of you in our faces, Lord. Help us to deny ourselves, take up our crosses and follow after you and seek you, Lord God. Help us to be just recklessly abandoned to you, God. Lord, you are all that really matters. You are all that really matters, God, because without you, we are nothing. We are absolutely nothing, God. Lord, open our eyes to you. Open our hearts to you. God, help us to worship you in a way that we've never worshiped you before. Help us to give all of us to you. God, remove our selfishness. Take our eyes off of ourselves, Lord. Amen. A friend of mine, Dustin Smith, wrote a song that says, You're all that really matters. It says, You are all that really matters. And I remember the first few times listening to that. Have you ever have you ever heard a song that you're like, oh man, that's that's good. Even right from the right from the first time you've heard it. And then you listen to it again and it's like, oh it's it's better now. And then you listen to it again and it's better now. And it just keeps just just opening you up. That's that's part of what this song does. There's lots of these songs out there that do that. Because these writers, they're asking the Holy Spirit to speak through them. The Word calls us to be His mouthpiece. It calls us to be His hands and His feet. It calls us to look like Him to the world. That's what we're supposed to be. Can we be that, though, if we're not looking at Him? Can we truly be that if we're not looking at Him? If we're not seeking Him consistently? If we're not asking Him to help us in everything that we do? He sends us. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that it's better for you that I go so that the Holy Spirit will come. And then He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. You know, and then he tells them to go to the upper room and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they did. And then he says, go and wait. And the Holy Spirit's going to come more. And the Holy Spirit came more. The Holy Spirit came and rested on them like tongues of fire. It wasn't these little, you know, we've all seen the pictures that people make up. You know, it's like a little tongue of fire. No! The Holy Spirit enveloped that room. The Holy Spirit fell on them. It consumed them like a consuming fire. There was nothing they could do about it. It fell on them. And it remained on them. That Spirit, that Spirit enabled them to go out and do the Great Commission, to look like Jesus, to look like God. That's what empowered them. Jesus is not right there with them, but He sends His Holy Spirit to literally wash over them, to be baptized in this Holy Spirit. And then again, we see, and again, the Holy Spirit comes on them, and again, He's in us and He's on us. He's moving in us and through us and around us. He's affecting the world with us. With us. Is it it not amazing that the God of all creation wants to use me and you to affect everything around us? But if our eyes turn from Him, 
and turn on to ourselves, oh, this is, this is difficult. This is difficult, God. I can't do this. Oh, I, but I need this. I, or, or I want this. And our eyes start looking at these other things. If our eyes aren't fixed on Him, then people are going to see what our eyes are fixed on. They're going to see where our priorities lie. And then we're going to look just like them. We're not going to be any different. So why would they want what we have if it's exactly like them? This morning I was praying and I, and I, I asked, Come awaken me, O God. Come awaken me, O God. Because I want to be what He wants me to be. I want to do what He wants me to do. People think, well, people have been asked the question, and I've been asked the question, and I've even asked the question. What do you want the world to remember you by? When you leave this world, what's the legacy you want to leave? Guys, I can't be more serious when I say the legacy I want to leave is Him. I don't want people to remember me. What good does it do if they remember me? Nothing. It doesn't do anybody any good. I want them to remember Him. Him and Him alone. Because He died for them. So that they can have this relationship with God. I don't want to leave my legacy. I want to leave His legacy. I don't want to get lost and, and go try to find myself. When I'm lost, I want to find Him. So what does this mean, come awaken me, O God? Come awaken me, O God. It's one thing to ask it. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to move in me deeper. I'm asking Him to move through me deeper. I'm asking Him to give me a new revelation of His love so that I can be that new revelation of His love. I've told you before, I have that face that people are like, what's wrong with Him? Is He mad at me? Is He mad at the world? I, I want people to look at me and go, wow, what's wrong with that dude? He's got more joy and love and passion and compassion for people than anybody I've ever seen. That's what I want radiating off myself. That's what I want radiating out of this face. I want to have that face like Moses when he comes off the mountain and, and his face is so bright and lit up and shining that people are like, what in the world? But I can only get that if I've been face to face with God. The creator of the universe. How can I think that if I go through my daily life, if I leave church today and I don't spend any time with him, intimate time with him every day, nobody's going to see any difference in me. I got to be face to face with him every day. Every single day, I've got to be face to face with him. You know, the Word tells us this, this most amazing, profound statement. It says His kindness leads us to repentance. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. But I want to point out people's wrongs. I want to point out all the things that they do that, that doesn't line up with the Word of God. And then I look at, at Jesus and how he, how he dealt with people, how he, how he worked on people. And He worked on them with love and compassion, and His kindness did lead them to repentance. Look at the woman at the well. <laughs> Just look at her. She was living completely backwards from what this said, and she kind of knew this too. She knew the Word. She knew the Word. She was raised in the Word. Or, or at least, sort of. Because she says, are, are you the Messiah? Are you the, the chosen one that was sent? <laughs> that's, a, that's amazing. 
He didn't say, you've been with these five people, these five other men, and the man that you're with right now, you're not married to, you sinner. What are you thinking? You're not following the word. You're condemned. You're condemned because of the word. No, he's the word and the word made flesh. He's the word, the word made flesh, and he loved her. And it was that love that led her to repent, to change her ways, to turn from what she was doing, and then go change the world because of him. Don't get caught up into this, this legalism, this, this legalistic point of view of people, because it will cause you to not love them. It will cause you to not love yourself, and if you don't love yourself, then you won't do what he's called you to do. You can't, because it's bondage, it's chains, it's imprisonment that you put yourself in and under because you start listening to the lies of the enemy, and you don't allow his forgiveness, his love, his kindness to lead you to that true repentance. When you've experienced that true repentance, that's whenever the world changes. That's whenever you change and you start changing the world around you. He starts changing the world around you through you. So how do we, how do we get started on this? What can we do if, if you ever find yourself like me, starting to condemn myself, starting to feel sorry for myself and like I let God down? Like I'm not good enough to do what he's called me to do. What do you do at that point? Let me tell you something. In Psalms 100 verse 4. I love this psalm. I love it. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his holy name. When you start praising your God. When you start praising the God who loves you and cares about you and is passionately in love with you, and you start sending these praises to Him, it takes your mind off of this other junk. You can't be focused on Him and it at the same time. So enter His courts with thanksgiving. Be thankful for everything that He's given you. Be thankful. Think about um, the disciples whenever they're in prison or the apostles, when they're in prison, they're bound in chains, and they start worshiping God. In their chains, in their bondage, they start worshiping. They start thanking Him, so much so that the prisoners are like, what is going on? The, the jailers even are like, this is, this is a little weird. You know, These were dungeons. They were dark, dingy, nasty, horrible places. Their feet were shackled to a wall. Guess what? That means they don't get to get up and go to the restroom. They don't have this nice little toilet and sink combo sitting in their wall. They don't get a nice comfy bed with, with a, even a little bit of a mattress on it. They're chained in these stalks. They're bound and they start worshiping and praising God. And literally, their praise and worship broke those, those chains, those bondages off of them. God saw them in their praise to him, a couple different times, breaks these chains off. And sometimes they even stayed there because they didn't want the jailer to get killed because they had love and compassion for him, their enemy at the time. Isn't it wild that God tells us to love your enemies? Love your enemies? It's like, man, God, you make things difficult. You make them difficult, man. I don't know. Maybe it's not hard for you guys. It can be hard for me. But he says that we can do all things because he gives us the strength, the power, and the ability to be able to do it because we walk in his power and his might and not in our own. If you think, I can't love my enemy, you're right. You can't love your enemy. You can't without him. But with him, all things are possible. All things. If you feel like that Nathan, you don't know what I've gone through. You're right. I don't. But he does. And he's the one that told you this. It's not coming out of my mouth. It's coming out of his mouth. 
I'm not trying to tell you the Nathan way. If I told you the Nathan way, you'd probably all stand up and leave thinking, I'm a nutcase. What is this guy trying to tell me? Like, believe me, uh, you don't want to solve problems the way that I naturally want to solve problems. It doesn't work out well. What is that answer? That answer is Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. One of the, the verses, the scriptures that hits me to my core every single time that I hear it is this. It's found in Isaiah 61.1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. This is Isaiah, guys. This is a prophet way before Jesus. This is a prophet that's being led by the Holy Spirit. That's speaking what the Holy Spirit's telling him to speak. And it's not for him right then. It's for people way down the road. And it's to come to pass. And he's talking about our Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What good can come out of Nazareth? Well, Savior of the world, that's what. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. Picture Isaiah in your mind saying this. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness the prisoners, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Isaiah is saying this. There's a lot of things that these prophets said that people are like, what is he talking about? What can he possibly be talking about? But then you roll up in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. And Jesus, Jesus, this our God in a fleshly body, fully man and fully God, walks in to the synagogue. This place where they, they preach, the, they teach the word, they read from these scrolls of the prophets. The Pentateuch. They're teaching, they're preaching the people how to live. Jesus rolls in there and he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. We are the poor, the poor in spirit, the poor, the brokenhearted, the wounded, the hurt, God has anointed him to proclaim this word. The good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted. Part of it says to bind up the brokenhearted. To mend the brokenhearted. And to proclaim freedom to the captives. The people that have been held captive in sin and shame. That's what he's doing. He's proclaiming freedom to us. Isaiah started it out and then Jesus is laying it out to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness, from sin, for the prisoners. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. The time of the Lord's favor has come. Isaiah had to be writing that saying, the time of the Lord's favor has come. And then they went into some serious darkness. He was put to death. But Jesus says, he lays all these things out. And then it says, he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant. Picture Jesus standing up in the synagogue, walking up. He hadn't created a big stink about anything quite yet. So they're like, hey. Here you go, you can read this. He rolls it out and reads it. He rolls it back up, hands it back to the attendant. <laughs> hands it back to the attendant and went and sat down. Then it says, all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently or they were fixed upon him. Because why? Not because this is the first time this word has ever been preached there. 
It's not because it's the first time anyone read this scroll in that synagogue. It's because it's the first time it was read with absolute authority through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is what made the difference. They're like, oh my goodness. Later on, when the the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're trying to trap Jesus and they send people to go trap him. They come back empty-handed and the the Pharisees are like, where is he? And they're like, you don't understand. Nobody talks like this guy. It's because he was speaking as God with the authority of the Holy Spirit behind him. So he sits down and everybody's staring at him intently. And then he began to speak to them. This is where things get a little rocky. He says, the scripture you just heard has been fulfilled this very day in your hearing. This scripture that Isaiah wrote hundreds of years ago, it just came to pass in your hearing. That's powerful. I mean, that's powerful. That's a game changer. That starts to change the world forever. And everything after that was super nice and easy and peaceful for Jesus. No. Everything after that, he really upset a lot of people. If you're doing what God calls you to do, guess what? You're going to upset a lot of people. If you're not upsetting a lot of people, you're not doing what God has called you to do. If everyone loves you and no one opposes you, guess what? It's not because you're great and you're doing everything right. It's because you're wrong. And you look just like them and you're no threat. That's just the simple fact of the matter. Jesus didn't come to make things all nice and easy and peachy for us. Honestly, he didn't. He said he came to bring a sword. Not a physical sword, but a spiritual sword. Here's here's the great news, though. Romans 6, 10 through 11 says, The Spirit... Of God, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, lives in you. So, that same Jesus that was reading that quote out of Isaiah, yes, they murdered him, tortured him, and murdered him. But the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, because he no longer is in the grave. He came out of that grave, and He is triumphant, and He is alive and well today at the right hand of the Father interceding on your behalf and my behalf. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will, not He might, not it's possible, it says He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. That same spirit living within you. So whenever he says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, and then he sends them to the upper room in the day of Pentecost, and the spirit falls on them. And they started acting in ways that might freak you out a little bit. It might be a little shocking to you. You might act in a way that you never expected that you possibly would. You better hope that you do. (laughs) If you don't, I'm going to question it a little bit. But seriously, that same Spirit is alive in you. And if it's not alive in you, it can be alive in you, and it will be alive in you. All you got to do is receive. You just have to believe. You have to receive. You have to accept. You have to be willing to die to yourself and turn from your uh, evil ways and accept Him and let Him work in you and through you. Some of us, and I'm guilty of this too, guys. I'm not pointing everyone out here. I'm saying we have refused to make God and His Word a priority in our lives. Is that a, is that a fair statement? I think it's fair. Because if you're anything like me, you have. We've refused to make Him a priority in our lives. 
And you can insert any excuse that you feel like you, could, you should insert there. Because my excuse might be different than yours, but it's still an excuse. We think that we can get by with just coming to church every now and then and still be okay. Well, guess what? You can't. You can't just come to church every now and then and still be okay. Is this church is coming in these, these doors going to save you? No. <laughs> nope. There's been hundreds of thousands, millions of people that have been saved, not in this church, not in these doors, not sitting in these seats. They've been saved out there by people that are willing to take the word to them, that are willing to live it, not just live it whenever we come in these doors. My goal is to be the same out there every single day as the same Nathan you see right here, standing up here. That's my goal. Am I always that? No. But I try like crazy. I'm going to continue to try like crazy. I want you guys to help keep me accountable. Because you're doing it too. And as I see you doing it, it's going to encourage me. And as you see me doing it, I want it to encourage you. If we do that more, then it's going to draw people not to this building. If they come to this building, great. If they don't, fine. What I want it to draw them to is to Him. I want them to see Him in us and go, I have to have that. I've got to have that. I can't go another minute without it. Here's water. What's to keep me from being baptized? What's to keep me from being filled with the Holy Spirit whenever I accept this God that you're telling me about, that you're showing me? That's what we got to do, guys. That's what we have to do. But if we think that we can, we can just show up here on Sunday and Pastor Rod or Jesse or Nathan is going to, uh, to bring us the Word and that that's going to sustain me for the whole week. So I don't have to Go spend time with my father. Well, you couldn't be more wrong. You couldn't be more wrong. I'm not here to preach a doom and gloom, guys, because our God is not doom and gloom. What I am here to do is try to give you a little bit that makes you thirsty for more. Give you a little bit that makes you hungry for more. So that you say, this, this God, I have to have more of this God. I have to have more of the one that loves me. He's called Abba Father. He's called our Father. And all of you that have children, think about how much you love it whenever your kids want to be with you. And they want to spend time with you. And He wants to do the same thing with you because you're His children. He's waiting so much just to see you, to have you come to Him. Because He wants to love on you and have fun with you. He wants to reveal more and more and more to you. Hebrews 12, 2 through 3 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. On Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Not let us fix our eyes on Nathan as he's standing up there talking. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. It's Him who builds your faith. He authored the faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word of God. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him, through, through what? Through the fear? No, through the joy set before Him, endured the cross, the scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him, it's telling us, the Word is telling us, consider Him. Think about this. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinful men, the people that created havoc in His life, that was constantly making things difficult for Him, hard for Him, so much so they were constantly trying to find a way to imprison Him, to beat Him, to kill Him. The chief priest of the day said it's better that one man should die for all the people. He prophesied that. He didn't know what he was talking about, but he prophesied that. That man, consider him who endured 
such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's easy for us to grow weary. It's easy for us to lose heart. Mostly because of our needs, our wants, our desires. I pray, God, God, please remove the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Remove it from me, God. Take it from me, God. Remove it from me, God, so that I will not grow weary and lose heart. I don't know when I'm going to leave this planet and step into glory with Him. I don't know. You don't know when you are. But I'm telling you right now, guys, between now and then, don't grow weary and lose heart. If you find yourself in that pattern of growing weary and losing heart, keep your eyes fixed on Him. It says consider Him. Consider the things that He had to go through. If you start finding that you're drifting off, look back to Him. That's the only way that it's going to happen, guys. That's the only way. In your struggle against sin, in your struggle against sin, we don't battle against flesh and blood, right? But against the powers and principalities of darkness that rule over this world. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. If you can hear me today, then you haven't died for God physically. Your physical body has not died for Him. That's what He's talking about here. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, but He loved you so much that He died, willfully went to the cross to die for you. Have you heard that song that says, He died for me, I'll live for Him? It's older. I was a kid. I, don't, I, don't know, I was young whenever that came out. But man, He did die for you. He did die for me. He asked us to live for Him, and then He tells, him, tells us, I'm going to give you everything that you need to be able to do that. Matthew chapter 6 Verses 19 through 20 says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal, but rather store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. It, isn't it easy to get in this, this, I want more, I need more, I want my comforts met, I need my comforts met, I want to store up, I want to, I want to make sure that not only my wife and I have everything that we need and want and desire, but I want to make sure that my kids have it, my kids' kids have it, my kids' kids' kids have it, because I want them to have all that stuff. Guys, what he wants us to store up for our wives and our wives for our husbands, for our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids and so on and so forth, is the real treasure. The real treasure. That's what the Word's talking about. It's so easy to take the Word and find these different verses and say, well, well this means I need to be focused on you know, working hard and, and saving up every last penny that I can and all this stuff. It's so easy to make it what we want it, what we think that it should sound like if we're not being led by the Spirit. He says, Jesus Himself literally said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on this earth that are just going to be destroyed. He said it's pointless. It's pointless. I'm telling you, it's pointless. You're worried and you're focused and you're striving for things that aren't worth it that aren't going to pay off because you can't take any of it with you. The only thing that you can take with you is your relationship with Him and the treasures that you store up in heaven, the crowns of the righteous that we're going to be able to throw at the feet of Jesus and give back to Him what He already gave to us. That's all that matters. That's literally all that matters. The more that we're focused on this junk here on earth that's just going to be destroyed, the less we're focused on Him, the less that we're going to be able to help lead and guide and direct people to the Father. I'm serious. 
at the end of the day, we all die here on earth. We all die here on earth. What are you doing between now and then to prepare for that? That's your true retirement. That's your real retirement. He says, enter into my rest. What is retirement? It's rest. Enter into my rest. <laughs> I... Second Chronicles. Chapter 20, verse 17. God tells the Israelites, You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. You don't have to fight the battle, but take up your positions. You don't have to fight the battle, but take up your positions. It doesn't mean you don't have to fight this battle. You can leave and do whatever you want. Go jump in a hot tub, chill out and relax. No. Nope. He says, you don't have to fight this battle, but take up your positions. Stand firm. And then what? And then you get to see the deliverance of the Lord. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, we have been grafted in. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Go out to face them tomorrow. For the Lord will be with you. Whew. Wow. Does that verse not just floor you? It floors me. I don't know. <laughs> it floors me. You will not have to fight this battle. I love that he starts it out with that. He starts it out with that. My wife called me one time whenever my oldest daughter wrecked her car for the first time, a couple of weeks after she got it. <clears throat> she calls me, says, Trinity's been in an accident. <sighs> uh, I was a cop for like 10 years. I worked a lot of horrible accidents. She's like, she's okay. Lead with that. Lead with that. What in the world? I'm at a meeting, at my, at literally sitting in a board meeting. And she calls. Trinity's been in an accident. Boom, my chair hit the wall. Nothing else mattered. She's okay. God led with it. He said, you will not have to fight this battle. That's what he led with. <laughs> but take up your positions. Stand firm, be faithful, do what you're called to do, do what you're supposed to do, and then watch me work. <laughs> See the deliverance that the Lord will give you. Sometimes that deliverance might look a little different than what you think it's going to look like. Pretty much all the time. In my life anyway. In my life anyway. I know that this, this message today may have sound repetitive to some of you that have heard me teach before. It may sound elementary to some of you. You're like sitting back there, I know this, Nathan. Nathan, we know this. Give me more, give me more steak. Give me something deeper. And I asked the Lord. I, I literally told the Lord. I said, God, this, is, this seems somewhat elementary and somewhat repetitive. But then he took me back to the fact that not all of us do spend consistent time in the Word. And even if we do, the Word is new every day. His mercies are new every day. The light of His Word is new every day. The, revel the revelation that His Word brings is new every day. If you found yourself sitting there saying, this is, this is elementary. I know this stuff already. Then I would ask you to take a step back and say, God, reveal my heart to me. 
and reveal your heart to me. Reveal your heart to me, God. The Word is alive. It is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can divide everything that's going on in your heart. It can reach you where you are. Even the most elementary word can reach you right where you are and change your life forever. If you're willing to let it. If you're willing to ask God and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what He wants you to get out of the Word, He will reveal it to you. He is for you. He is not against you. He is loving and compassionate. And that is the truth. That is the truth. I'm not lying to you. And if you feel otherwise... You're listening to a lie. Do not listen to a lie. Do not allow Satan any foothold. Don't let it. As we close today, I'm going to pray for us. And we are going to open up the altars up here today. The elders will come up and be willing to pray for anybody for any reason. If you don't know God, the God that I was just telling you about, and you want to, then come up. Come see me. Don't be embarrassed. Don't feel like, well, I, I can't come up because then people will know that, that I didn't know him before. <laughs> no, I'm telling you that is a lie from the pit of hell. Everyone will rejoice with you. Everyone will rejoice with you. I don't care if you've stubbed your toe and you want healing for your stubbed toe. If you're brokenhearted, if you're dealing with oppression, if you're dealing with attacks of the enemy trying to, trying to keep you in that bondage and you feel like that you need set free from it, then come up here. A lot of people say, well, bow your heads and close your eyes without anybody looking around. That way you can, you can make this confession of your faith. Nope, you're not ever going to see me do that. You're not ever going to hear me say that because it's not biblical. It's not. So I want everyone to know because if you are ashamed of him in front of men, he will be ashamed of you in front of the Father. I'm not going to put you in that situation. And if you're not willing to step out in bold faith for him, then the word says that you're not cut out to do his work. Man, kind of a gut punch, isn't it, sometimes? But that's what he said. <laughs> not me. But seriously, we're going to play some soft worship music. I'm probably going to kick some more of those lights off. Guys, if you have to go, then it's okay. You don't need to stay. But I do encourage you to stay and go deeper with God. We're not going to just shut these doors. We're not going to kick on the lights and, you know, everybody out. It's not what we're going to do. This, uh, this time is going to be uh, for intimate worship, for going deeper with God. That's what it's for. If you want prayer, come up and get prayer. We love you guys. And um, I'll close this out. Heavenly Father, thank you, God. Thank you for your love and your kindness, your goodness, Lord. You truly are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, Lord, and you are the end. You are the King of all kings. You are the Lord of all lords, and we do enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving, God. Thank you, Lord, that you have created us and that you've breathed your breath of life into us. Lord, and I pray that you will give us the strength and the courage to stand up for you and who you are, God. And I pray that you will make us look like you and be like you, God. Help us, Lord, to reveal you and your love to this world. God, renew a right spirit in us. Set our eyes right and our minds right, God. Help us to seek you with the hunger and the fervor of a new baby Christian. God, help us to go after you with everything that we are. And help us, Lord, 
to give you everything that we are. God, we dedicate ourselves to you. We dedicate our lives to you. We dedicate our lips, our speech, our hands, our feet to you, God. These are yours, Lord. These are yours, and I pray that you will take them and do with them what you will, God. Anything, any part of us that's in our heart, Lord, that is resisting that and fighting that, I pray that you will rip it out of us right now. You will rip it out of us, God. God, take it out of us. Cast it as far as the east is from the west, Lord. We want to be your slaves, your bond servants, wholly, completely devoted to you. Holy and completely devoted to you, Lord. I pray that you will remove selfishness, that you will remove the pride of our eyes. Lord, that you will remove the pride of our flesh, the lust of our flesh and the pride of life, God. I pray that you will remove those things from our midst, God. Help us to be holy and completely devoted to you, the one true God. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.